Well, thank you, Paula Poundstone, for joining us. Um, my name is Ian Saint, and I'd like to thank you for speaking with us at WOUB Public Media. We are the PBS affiliate in Ohio, uh, where you're going to be performing a couple of shows. Uh, First, the Taft Theater in Cincinnati on March 17th, and the Southern Theater in Columbus on March 18th. Uh, and I know you performed in Dayton uh, last November. Um, and so I guess my first question would be, uh, you know, it, it seems perhaps you've done a fair number of shows in Ohio over the years. And I was just wondering uh, if there's any memories of Ohio that stand out to you or just general observations as you've toured the Buckeye State. Well, I do work in Ohio a lot because there's a lot of cities in Ohio. Um, sure are. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's probably the most important Ohio interaction I've ever had is that my cat Baloo came from Ohio. I, w I used to work a club many, many, many years ago um, uh, called Wiley's in Dayton, Ohio. And oh, wow. I, I would, you know, so I'd be there for five days as opposed to now when I work theaters and I'm only in for a night. Um, yeah. But uh, this is a long, long time ago. And and I was hanging out at the club during the day. No, I guess, no, I guess it was late at night. And and two of the bartenders told me that during the day, that's what it was, they worked at a vet's office. And they told me that someone had dropped off a box of kittens. And uh, so uh, so I went in the I went in the next day and, and yeah. got my cat Baloo, best cat I ever had. Oh, must have been funny. the Dayton blood. Must have been the Ohio roots. <laughs> I was actually born in Dayton, so that is a very touching remark. <laughs> See? Yeah, there's something. I don't know is the barometric pressure. I don't know what it is, but there's something about Dayton. Uh, and I used to this. love being there for five nights. One of the things that I made note of when walking around Dayton at one point was that the Otis Elevator uh, company is there. Really? And the, Yes, and that their office building is one floor. Oh my goodness. I need to jump down this rabbit hole and get to the bottom <laughs> of the story there. It had to be deliberate, or maybe they were pioneers and they, you know, developed the technology and the building was grandfathered in some historic. Yeah, just code. never got around to. I mean, maybe it's different now, but I, this was, this would have been, I don't know, 80s. Yeah. Maybe in the 80s. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe since then they've gotten two they've floors. But expanded time, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think of Dayton every time I step on an elevator, not because it's necessarily an Otis elevator, but because it reminds me of walking by the yeah. Otis elevator building and discovering that it was one floor. Maybe oh. the people who make it know more than we do. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm I'm gonna have to dedicate a whole episode to this now. No, I'm just kidding. I would think. But <laughs> well, speaking of the 80s, you know, I, I I would imagine many folks, you know, first knew of you perhaps from your comedy specials on HBO uh, or maybe, you know, your your appearances throughout the 1992 election cycle where you were a very prominent, unforgettable character uh, and commentator, etc. cetera. Um, but you have been in comedy for over four decades and entertaining generations now. Uh, and I'm not a spring chicken, but I am a millennial. And I actually first knew of you from To Tell the Truth. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. That was so much fun, that show. Yeah, the, the iteration hosted by uh, John O'Hurley in the 2000s. Yeah, uh, and uh, 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 Meshach Taylor uh, was my partner on the end of the uh, on the end of the panel there. Oh, my gosh, we had fun doing that show. Yeah. Was it a little bit of the uh, Brett and Charles Nelson Riley chemistry going on there as far as the <laughs> Perhaps. You know, ping pong? Perhaps. Yeah. Was that the show that they were on though? No, I think they were on like Match, on match game, game or something. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, we had uh, the, the person, uh, okay, to tell the truth had a number of iterations. At, right. But the original to tell the truth um, had uh, a woman named Kitty Carlisle, who I believe was Moss Hart's wife. Um, and uh, she was one of the original panelists on uh, to tell the truth, the, like the old black and white one. Mm -hmm. And so they had her on the one that I did as a, um, as you know, somebody that you had to guess. And I think they had like something over their faces or something. I can't remember anymore. Um, you know, you know, I'm Kitty Carlisle. I'm Kitty Carlisle. Right. And uh, so after, you know, we did the show or maybe before something, it was her birthday. So they, 
you know, they wheeled out a birthday cake and she was quite elderly. She was, uh, uh, she said she was 90 at the time, um, but they told me that uh, she was actually older than that. <laughs> uh, well, I would imagine, but, I mean, this was the 2000s, you know, so it was already many decades. After no, I think it was, I, yeah, it might've been, it might've been. Yeah, you're right, it might've been. So, uh, so anyways, at one point we were standing, uh, they were taking a picture and we were standing beside each other. We didn't know each other, um, uh -huh. but you know, just to make conversation, I said, uh, Kitty, where do you live? And she said, I broke both my hips. Oh, God. And, you know, the problem is that socially, I didn't know what to do with that. Do I bother <laughs> repeating? Do I bother saying, no, that's not what I asked? And repeating my question, I huh? opted to go, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> did, like, did it... Oh, it was small talk. It could have it could have taken any direction. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, so, I mean, I guess on that note of, you know, that's how I first got acquainted with you. Um, I interviewed Murray Osmond recently, and, uh, you know, she's kind of in a similar boat where she's been entertaining generations of fans. And she said a lot of her youngest fans tell her that they actually first knew of her from Nutrisystem commercials. Well, I um, would think, yeah. Yeah. And so that kind of got me wondering, you know, what's the oddest circumstances you've heard from someone who's become a fan, uh, but they, they kind of became acquainted of you in a way that you hadn't anticipated or you don't hear a whole lot? Well... I don't know if it's that I didn't anticipate, but a lot of people do tell me that um, there was a, a there was a little period of time where a videotape of a show that I uh, made with a couple of other comics for Pop Tarts oh. was uh, for Kellogg's but uh, Pop Tarts, uh, where you could send in um, you know box tops from Pop Tarts and a little bit of money, whatever it was, and get this videotape. And a lot of people tell me that they wore that tape out when they were kids. Oh, wow. um, or, you know, and sometimes people even bring me the box and ask me to sign it. And I, I hadn't seen it and because it was this was quite a while ago. So I hadn't seen it in a really <laughs> long time. And by the way, um, I allowed I allowed the um, stylist, the Kellogg stylist. I guess that would be the person who tells Tony the Tiger what to wear. I allowed <laughs> I them. Like, so when I look at the picture on the cover, I'm like, oh. Uh, they... <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't always like now. I don't know. I you're, you're right. I've been at this for 43 years. Yeah. And it's the best job in the entire world. I'm the luckiest person. Um, but it took me probably, I don't know. It probably took me 35 years to get to where I can go, yeah, I'm not wearing that. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I was, I was kind of a late bloomer in terms yeah. of advocating for myself. <laughs> well, you know, I think a lot of people are in that boat. I think that um, perhaps if there is a silver lining of this dreadful, um, you know, and COVID is still going on, so I don't want to say pandemic in the past test, but, uh, right. but the pre-vaccine era, um, you know, a lot of people were reevaluating their lives and their directions and their boundaries and things like that. And so you saying that, I, I don't think um, you, you might not be as late as you might think, because I, I hear this so often when I'm talking to people uh, lately about how, uh, you know, this was a terrible thing to go through, but it did make them realize uh, things about themselves and, and implement things in their lives that they, uh, in retrospect, wish they had done sooner. I, th I think so. I think uh, for a lot of us, myself included, um, I have something terrible to confess, which is that prior to COVID, I might have, I have, I have no evidence of this, but I might have whined about travel oh. here and there. Oh, Lord. Yeah, maybe <laughs> a little. Well, let me tell you. I, you, you know what? You can fold me into the overhead compartment to get me to a job. I don't care. I am thrilled to be working in theaters <laughs> in front of audiences. And how dare I ever have felt otherwise? I mean, it's not that I didn't want to be in front of the audience. It was, right. the, you know, the travel and the schedule. And now I'm like, you know what? I get up a lot of times. I've cat hair all over me, so I'm itchy. Um, I, I get up at three in the morning at the hotel to go to the airport. You know what? 
and I, you're happy to I do it. I trot across that lobby. I, Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> happy as a clam. And, uh, you know, yeah, I think a lot of people re reevaluated lots and lots. Of, I mean, much, uh, much, um, much more significant things than that, I think. Oh. About two weeks before COVID hit, I swear it was about two weeks before COVID hit, I said to my oldest daughter, um, and I never was very good about teaching my kids about money. Um, but I said to my oldest daughter, I go, you know, you have to save money because you don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And and bad things do happen. And so you have to you have to have that cushion. You have to have saved money. That was about two weeks. Boy, I had the biggest I told you so coming my way. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up the, you know, dressing as you wish, because. I uh, had read where you had a management company early in your career in the 80s, uh, and you were 23 years old, and they had this fixation with the way that you dressed, which is, you know, certainly looking back kind of ironic because, you know, that's part of what makes you stand out. And that's part of why people love you. And, uh, you know, especially now that, you know, there are so many comedians, not only on TV, but in TikTok and, and things like that. So to have a distinct uh, marker that people, you know, identify and, and cherish is, is wonderful. But I also was a little bit struck by that. Cause I'm like, wait a minute, this would have been the eighties. Like who were they really to judge how you dress? Because they Honestly. maybe looking back would not be so proud of how they dressed either. I mean, <laughs> you know what? It was older guys. It was a very powerful management company. Uh, and I was happy to be with them at the time, but it was mm -hmm. older guys. And the truth is when you look back over their roster over the years, they had a handful of women ever. And, there, and the women didn't stay with them for very long. And there's mm -hmm. a good reason for that, which is it just wasn't their you know, forte, uh, knowing what to do with a woman. And the world of comedy, uh, it's certainly over the years hasn't always known what to do uh, with women, particularly as a stand-up comic, not so and, much like a, a sitcom person. I mean, because, uh, you know, because there's, because we have Lucille Ball. I mean, you couldn't say- I was going to say, you're about. saying this with Lucille Ball over your shoulder, literally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and in um, the 50s, no less, a, you know, a pretty patriarchal right. time. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, there were lots of women uh, starred in sitcoms, um, but I don't, you know, there weren't as many women stand-ups. And so, I don't know. I, I just think they didn't. They they always reminded me a little bit of my father in that yeah. uh, in that he didn't really know what to say to girls either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they were very concerned that I wasn't, you know, I remember I have for many, many years done a thing about how I don't like sex. You know, mm -hmm. I'll say on stage, you know, I don't like sex. Yep. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm happy for the rest of you. I'm not, uh, it's not like a prudish thing. Just, I don't know, it just doesn't do anything for me. Uh -huh. And I realize that that's somewhat unique. It's not, I'm not the only one though. I can no. tell you that. No. And, I... But this used to just panic them that I would say that. They were, yeah, you know, they would say, don't, oh, don't say that. Um, because it wasn't, because it wasn't their feeling. But the truth is, you know, I think one of the things, there, there's so many things that have come out of the stay at home order and this COVID period of life. And one of them, for me anyways, and I think I can speak for some of my audience members, um, one of the things we really missed was um, being audience members. Uh, you know, as a performer, obviously I missed having an audience and you can't do stand-up comedy via Zoom in your living room. You just can't. Trust right. me, a lot of us tried. It can't be done. Yeah. Um, but this thing where you enjoy something with a group of mostly strangers collectively that takes you through some sort of emotional, uh, you know, uh, trail, uh, be it laughter, right? It could be a movie, it could be a you know, funny movie, scary movie, a, you know, one that combines all those things. Some sort of emotional trail that you go through could be a concert of music, right? That you go through as this collective group. It must have something to do with when we lived in caves. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but that experience is so valuable. Um, I remember I... <clears throat> 
I love the Three Stooges, and uh, my I showed the Three Stooges my kids many many times. I have them on DVD and VHS, and I don't know. I just I love them, mm -hmm. and so I took the kids one time to um, Three Stooges Film Festival, and you know when we would watch at home. Uh, and certainly when I watched by myself, the three students, I acknowledge that I think that things are funny. I don't laugh out loud. In fact, for the most part, when somebody types LOL into their thing, they're lying. Or not um, LOL. But, yeah. uh, you know, but here we were watching in a theater full of people, strangers. Um, uh, but everybody there was a Three Stooges fan. Hmm. And we were caught up in waves of laughter. You, you appreciate things differently when you're with other people. And there's something, you know, there's only, there's only a couple of strings on that guitar. Not every experience can replicate that. Right. Um, and so I think it was really missing. I, I remember one day um, during the stay at home order, uh, I was on Twitter or something and Nils Lofgren posted uh, a little clip of a Springsteen concert but it was mostly the audience. I burst into tears. And it wasn't because I was missing having an audience in front of me. It's because I was missing being a part of a group emotional experience. And yes. I don't think most of us would have known how important that was to us had we not had the stay at home order. I love what you said about that though, because I literally just the other day interviewed Winona Judd, who's who's going through a period of, of mourning, you know, with what happened to her mom and going on a tour that she was supposed to do with her mother. And she talked about how important it was to hear the audience singing back to her and how, you know, there's a perfectionism that you surrender in live performance versus when something is in the studio uh, and it's not edited. Um, and that's hard for, you know, someone of, of her stature and entertainment. But at the same time, she said, you know, it's like being suspended between here and heaven when you hear that validation from a sea of people that you know um, you're resonating with and how powerful- Oh, it's the best. Yeah, yeah. You know, the truth is, I used to bust tables at a restaurant in Boston when I was young and uh, I was really good. When I left, they had to hire like two people. Um, oh, gosh. I was really good. Part of it's because I have OCD. Um, yeah. And so <laughs> I, I, I was a really good table busser. I was in the world of table busing. I was, you know, I would say one of the top five um, okay. You know, in the world of comedy, I'm good, but I'm not in the top five. And uh, and yet, no one ever applauded me. <laughs> no, oh, okay. very, yeah. very few people. I mean, the waiters and waitresses would express, uh, you know, some amount of appreciation of my work. But I never had that, like, sort of collective, like, <laughs> you know, oh, my gosh, this meant so much to us. Uh -huh. um, so, uh yeah. So being a performer, I see where she, why she says that, you know, it, it is. Uh, it's it's nice. Yes. Yes. And that's that's why people do it for free for a really long time. Right. <laughs> that's a great point. <laughs> well, I've, and I'm glad you brought up the OCD because I was reading a review of your show that you did at the Wadsworth Theater in L.A. way back in 2008. And you had ended your set by confessing that your chatterbox kind of ultimately oh. speaks to the OCD. And this, you know, your mind is so wildly associative, it never runs out of material. And this hit me like a ton of bricks because I have OCD myself and it's caused, you know, a good amount of grief in my life at different points. And, you know, especially in adolescence and, you know, things of that sort. Yeah. Um, but I swear this is why I like interviewing people. And, and I've had, you know, famous people who've done, you know, millions of interviews uh, tell me like, oh my God, nobody's ever asked me that question. And it's just because I can fixate on something that they say and run wild with it. And yeah. so is that kind of um, what you were alluding to? with, with Yes, was everything that gets said reminds me of something that I feel yeah. that I must say. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, I'm, yeah, ahead. it's why I, it's why I don't go to like funerals and memorials hmm. um, <laughs> because <laughs> I, I would likely do too much time. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, would, I would likely inadvertently forget to focus on <laughs> the, the loved one. 
Yeah, no, I mean, that's fair. I've I've been in that situation too. And there's there's one in particular where I cringe looking back on and we won't rehash it, but I feel your pain. And I'm sure many people watching this do. And Well, um, the thing about OCD is, I mean, it took me a very long time to figure out that that was an aspect of that, a symptom mm -hmm, of that. Mm -hmm. OCD, for those who don't know, is obsessive compulsive disorder and everyone has it. Mm -hmm. It's only diagnosed uh, according to the degree that it interrupts your life. Mm -hmm. And it's so eclectic in the way that it manifests itself. We don't all have the same symptoms uh, yeah. that a lot of people don't realize that that's what that is. And by the way, by figuring out that that's what that is, it doesn't necessarily stop it. But I don't know. You don't feel as bad about it. Maybe it allows you to better um, harness uh a direction that would be beneficial. Uh, you know, everything can be a pro and a con or a double-edged sword. I'm pretty sure the Wright brothers had raging OCD. I had a, <laughs> a, a book about them one time, like a gorgeous picture book of them. And uh -huh. it, it had for, it had photos of their hut um, on uh, kid, at Kitty Hawk. Yeah. And all the canned goods on their shelf were facing in the same direction. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, they, and they, <clears throat> they tested that glider, I think many more times than they probably had to. And yeah. <laughs> they wore suits on the beach. So I all love these things suggest to me that the Wright brothers had OCD and probably to our benefit. And I don't want an accountant that doesn't have OCD. So there are applications for it. Yeah, I love that. And I love that you noticed the cans all facing forward. Oh, that I'm so jealous. That's why I love Paula Poundstone. <laughs> <laughs> so my last question, you know, we, we've been talking a lot about, uh, you know, uh, I guess the evolution uh, or the journeys we've been on and, and realizing self and and uh, understanding self and, and bettering self and, uh, you know, paradigm shifts over time. And, uh, you know, I guess navigating disappointments that might have been, you know, silver linings and things of that sort. And uh, something that I thought of in your story, you know, something that you had expressed as, uh, I don't know about a disappointment, but something that you were lamenting. Uh, you had said that you had always wanted to show like uh, Carol Burnett or Mary Tyler Moore or Lucille Ball. And you felt like that, you know, opportunity is just not in the cards for you at, at this point in your career. Um, and, you know, I was thinking about, you know, all the accomplishments, of course, that you have had, and yet there's, you know, still something that, uh, you know, it can be a little bit of a bummer, I guess, if you get too fixated on it. But at the same time, I was, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, you you appeared alongside Ellen DeGeneres in uh, Women of the Night, the HBO special in the 80s. And uh, I, you know, was sort of thinking about her show. Uh, now, granted, this was, now she's had a sitcom, but she, and I love that sitcom. Um, I, I wish it were more in syndication and stuff because I thought it was really funny. But besides the point, you know, her talk show, uh, also a wonderful program. Um, but then it, you know, it grew to such a height uh, and such a level of celebrity and such a, a behemoth and operation that, you know, towards the end, uh, you know, there were a lot of issues that kind of, um, you know, sort of tarnished it, I guess, in, in some way, or one could argue it tarnished it in some way where, you know, uh, I guess there were just things going on behind the scenes that she could not even control. You know, she she didn't have oversight of, and and it uh, yet she still kind of faced blowback from that happening. And so I'm thinking about what you said about how you know you would have liked your your own show and and how it's it's you know a bummer that that didn't happen. But at the same time, is there something to be said about how you know over the course of your career you you've had a, a lot of autonomy about. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. Like, you know, there's there's something to be said about uh, something that didn't become so big that you kind of lose sight of what it was about and why you wanted to go into it, and you get to do exactly what you want to do. Does this make any sense? I'm kind it of does. Reform associate. I've always maintained a small staff. <laughs> well, and, there's something to be said about that, context. about oversight and and protecting your your image and your direction and your your mission, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't I, I don't have to. Uh, I remember years ago seeing some sort of story. I don't know. It was like on a magazine show or something a long time ago that Britney Spears had to have stores closed in order to shop. 
Uh, I, I can walk right in. I, uh, <laughs> I'm only a I'm only a household name in my house. I insist on it here. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, not. Uh, uh, I'm sure that there's good and bad in both worlds, and mm -hmm. uh, mostly, I, I've just. Mostly, I just feel lucky to do what I get to do. Yes. And, uh, it, it, you know, and again, you know, maybe there was something about the, the stay at home order and realizing, as I told my oldest daughter, you know, something can happen. You never know what. Right. Um, uh, you know, I don't even know that. I mean, I, I really foolishly had just always assumed, even though I did tell my daughter she had to save money for that reason. But um, I, I just always assumed that, you know, that I would do this job until I'm, you know, a, a, 102. Mm -hmm. um, and until you're uh, a kiddie's age on to tell the truth. <laughs> yes, exactly. And maybe I, and maybe I will. Um, yeah. But there is, you know, there is, you know, there is the possibility that, you know, one of these damned cats will bite me and I'll get some hideous <laughs> infection and it's, and it's all over. Right, right. Or worse than being all over. It's not all over. But, you know, I'm not able to, uh, you know, communicate or whatever, you know. So, uh, yeah. So, I, and I don't know if that's a, if that's an age thing or whatever, where you do just get to a point where you're like, you know what? I count my lucky stars. Yeah. And there's liberation in that, too. In I some think there way. is. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I think there is. And, uh, you know, I felt sorry for Britney Spears when I heard she had to have stores closed in order to mm -hmm. shop. Right. She can't cannot, you know, uh, assess the cans and what direction they're facing in peace. That's right. There's so much at the time. <laughs> I think probably back when I heard that, um, I was still catalog shopping. So uh -huh. I, part yeah. of me said, doesn't she just get some catalogs? <laughs> we'll have to hit, bring Brittany on the program and, and pick her brain. Yeah. But I have so then, many questions. Yes. Yes. We'll make sure to, uh, to rein you in on that. We'll check your, your schedule and hers. Uh, well, speaking of schedules, we know we, you've got to jump and we want to thank you once again for this wonderful conversation with WOUB uh, in Ohio. We're very excited to welcome you back to the Buckeye State and uh, we wish you smooth travels. We know you'll be over the moon to be doing it regardless of what barriers might come in the way as we had discussed. Nothing, nothing can keep me from Ohio, I'll tell you yeah. that. <laughs> well, we're lucky for it and uh, I guess break a leg. All right. Thanks a lot, Ian. Nice talking right. with you. Yeah, you too. Thank you, Paula. Thank you for watching WOUB Public Media, your NPR and PBS source in Ohio. Be sure to hit that subscribe button to catch more of our YouTube content in the future. Thank you.